Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. The question that I'm asking now is, is housing the only thing that we can or should be doing? There are just so many disparities in how we provide services. How are certain neighborhoods and communities policed? I'm Sarah Fenske. Terrell Carter took over as executive director of RISE Community Development in February. He had big shoes to fill. Stephen Acri was set to retire after running the local nonprofit for 20 years. Under his leadership, RISE assisted with the development of $300 million in residential projects, adding more than 1,000 units of affordable housing to St. Louis. That's big, but Terrell Carter also has big plans, and he joins us today to discuss them. So, Terrell, welcome. Thank you for having me on. So, you've been on this job now for about six months. Do you feel fully settled in? Well, about four months, and no, I don't think I will be settled in anytime soon. So, Yeah, four months. You're still pretty early on here. Yep. Did you have a transition there? I mean, 20 years, somebody leaving after 20 years, that's tough in any job. We did have a, an intentional transition of three months where Stephen uh, still served the organization when I became uh, executive director. So we split the title of president with Stephen, executive director with me. And after the first week, I began to handle the to provide day to day leadership to the staff, uh, while Stephen helped to make sure that any uh, you know lingering kind of projects that he had been on. Uh, were being taken care of, and his expertise was added to those. And after three months, he fully retired, and it's the ship that I'm leading now. <laughs> now you're leading it. And do you feel like you know the direction you want to take that ship? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all? <laughs> no, that's a joke. I, 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 I do. I, so I was very familiar with RISE. Um, I've done a couple of different things in my career, and uh, but the longest tenure in um, an industry was a construction. So I was a everything uh, on the side of building a house or a development I had done, and then a couple of different things on the management side. I'd even uh, led a smaller CDC. And throughout each of those kind of incarnations or iterations of my construction career, I had the privilege of working with RISE. So I had the opportunity to build relationships with some of their employees, uh, to become familiar with how they did things and the impact that they made. So uh, when I was offered the opportunity to come on board, I never felt like I had to, it's not my job or I'm not there to try to reinvent the organization because the organization does extremely good work and has done it for several years. Uh, I think it's my privilege now to help us as a team think through, like, what's the next step or how do we take it to not the next level, but how do we uh, do whatever it is we do um in order to make a, a greater impact. So I do have an idea, but that idea is not mine that I'm developing on my own. It's in consultation or cooperation with the staff. So uh, I literally just left a planning meeting, a uh, uh, six hour planning meeting that's Whoa. going on. So when this interview is done, I get to go back to to that as well. <laughs> So these big questions are on the table. They I mean, are this, on the this table. organization is is thinking about this right now. Yeah, it's so. When I started, I one of the things I've always done has been to ask questions. Again, don't come in as the expert. Don't come in like you know everything. Learn what you can, and then incorporate other people into that process from the very beginning. And one of the ways I did that is to go out to the community and ask our partners, our former partners, ask people who uh, live in the developments that we have uh, participated in, to ask them, what have we done well? What have we not done well? Um, you know, how did we make you feel? How did we incorporate you into the process? So um, that was part of the first step of the process. And I learned, and I'm continuing to learn because I do that almost every day. Uh, so some of these ideas of what we think we may be doing in the future is going to be informed by that as well. So, mm. so I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions out there about um, what you guys even do. I mean, right. people hear affordable housing, they think, okay, maybe I'll go to those guys for help with my benefits, mm -hmm. or I'll, I can get a HUD voucher from them. Right. Or uh, Tell us, what is in the simplest form, what is it exactly that RISE does? So this is one of the things we were talking about in this planning meeting. We work with 
and for residents to transform neighborhoods so those residents can have more access to equity and opportunity. So that's the elevator speech. But what we do is we try to help make, we participate in the process of making healthier, stronger communities and neighborhoods. We do that a couple of different ways. We um, do it through um, locating resources to bring you know, funds, uh, other opportunities into communities. We do it by helping uh, to have houses or commercial uh, properties developed and built in the community. Uh, we do that additionally by consulting with um, municipalities, cities, those kinds of groups. We also do that with neighborhood groups as well. So we value partnerships. We recognize the expertise that uh, people who live in that community bring to the table. And so if an organization doesn't have the capacity, say, that we have, they don't have as many employees or they don't have as much experience as we do, we will come alongside them and help them learn the things they need to learn in order to do what it is they want to do or are being asked to do uh, to help equip them and also to help them find resources as well. Uh, we also have a CDFI, which is a Community Development Financial Institution. And the goal of the CDFI is not to be a bank, but to be a lender uh, to people or for opportunities that may not traditionally um, qualify for traditional lending. For example, we will um, fund uh, small minority and women-owned businesses. We will also fund uh, developers or uh, portions of development projects in particular communities and neighborhoods. And again, because we are a CDFI, uh, we have certain regulations, all the positive, wonderful things that people, uh, that help people know they can trust us, but we also have a certain level of flexibility that a Bank of America does not have or a commerce bank. And so the neighborhoods that you might be um, doing those uh, community development financial institution work in, again, mm -hmm. that's CDFI. I feel like I shouldn't use that acronym too casually mm -hmm. for people listening. Um, are those neighborhoods that might have seen redlining by traditional lenders? It could, yes. Uh, so we don't have a um, – yes, that it, those could be neighborhoods, yes. So if um, – I'm trying to think of a, a particular neighborhood that would be a good example without, uh, you know, either it coming across as being negative. So if we wanted to do a project or someone wanted to do someone wanted to do a project in the Ville or the Greater Ville community, which is the neighborhood that I grew up in, mm. um, they would come to us uh, and say, I am a developer. I have this idea for a plan. Uh, and we would help make sure they get technical assistance, meaning we would either we or one of our partners would walk them through the process of making sure that their books are in order, that they are doing all the things that, again, a, in a sense, a traditional lender would do, uh, but also help them develop the plan that they need to make sure that it fits, you know, that it's checking the boxes, that it's uh, aware of the things that it needs to be aware of or takes that into account. That this plan is not going to fail. You're there you go. And so it's uh, those kinds of things where typically a bank would, you would go to them and they would say, do you have this? Yes, no. Yes, okay. Then we can go to the next step. If you say no, then we're just done, period. Come back to us when you get this all together. But our staff, uh, Colleen Hafner, uh, who is a director of the CDFI, who does an outstanding job uh, working with uh, potential partners, uh, she will sit down with, uh, either, again, developers or uh, people within the construction industry and, and walk them through the process of understanding where they are, what they need, and the steps to get um, to where they want to be. Hmm. So you're working with all these community development corporations to help them do better work. You're working with these neighborhoods to get to that point. You're also then the lender, really. I mean, In some ways, yes, we are. So there's a lot going on here, mm -hmm. and you guys work with so many different stakeholders. Yep, we work in the city of St. Louis, uh, St. Louis County, Madison County, and I'm forgetting, and um, St. Clair County. So this is a lot. I can see why you guys need to, to, you know, this process that you're in the middle of, of your thinking, okay, what do we focus on? How do we right. get there? Like, there's a lot of different paths and routes. Historically, um, was there one of these that was that sort of took the lead and, and now things are, are diffusing? Or are you more pulling pulling back more? Historically, what is one of what? I guess the origin of, you know, this organization founded. Did it start doing one of these things and then branch off? So I am learning and relearning and updating on the history of the organization obviously. Um, so RISE comes about from the combination of a multiple or multiple organizations. Uh, one was uh, the Technical Assistance Corporation, which is called TAC. 
there was another one called the Regional Housing Commission. Um, and each of those organizations did something different. So mm-hmm. one focused on uh, helping uh, maintain projects that were on the verge of uh, for- foreclosure. Mm-hmm. And then another one did something else. Um, one organization had a handful of staff. Another organization had a little more staff. Uh, but at a certain point, uh, the boards of those two organizations got together and decided or recognized that they would be stronger together. And so they formed the Regional Housing, RHCDA, and I always forget what that means. I'm sorry, Stephen, <laughs> <laughs> my predecessor. So, yeah, uh, but so. so it formed RHCDA, and then years later, it was turned, uh, changed the name to RISE. Uh, but it combines all these different things. And so the, the goal has always been to make stronger, healthier communities through housing. So housing has always been the focus. The question that I'm asking now is, is housing the only thing that we can or should be doing? Mm -hmm. Are there other opportunities to address needs? Because housing is wonderful. So I don't want it to sound like I am against that or that I'm saying we're doing the wrong thing. That's not it at all. Uh, But research shows um, just anecdotal data and interaction with people shows that housing is just one component of how you make a stronger, healthier, more equitable community. Uh, you have to incorporate so many other things, whether it's you know access to food, uh, the communities, the neighborhoods that I grew up in. Uh, you know, we had to travel multiple miles before we could get to a grocery store. But if you go to the community where I live now in South St. Louis, and we have four grocery stores within a stone's throw, I mean, why is that okay for South St. Louis and not for areas in North St. Louis or uh, other particular uh, communities in St. Louis. Uh, in addition to housing, you have to have adequate transportation. Uh, again, you look at certain streets or communities uh, in North St. Louis, and you'll be lucky if you have you know two to three bus stops versus how many we have on South Grand, where I used to be a police officer. So I was a police officer for a few years as well in South St. Louis, North St. Louis, and then South St. Louis again. Uh, And even just in that, there are just so many disparities in how we provide services and where we place emphasis in this city on who gets treated, who gets access to, who gets resources, and in what communities, and to what uh, degree they get it uh, as well. So uh, that's another thing we have to think through is how are certain neighborhoods and communities policed or those kind of things. And that's just a totally different conversation. Um, So housing is the beginning and it's an outstanding beginning but it's just the beginning so how do we also take into account these other things that contribute to stronger healthier neighborhoods and communities we're talking today to Terrell Carter he is the executive director of rise community development took that job in February took over a few months later there was a bit of a transition there with the uh, former executive director who was retiring you mentioned you'd been a cop and I gotta say as I was studying up for this interview today um, I found myself so intrigued you have such an interesting background you've had so many interesting jobs over the years and certainly your work as a police officer mm-hmm. um, this is something that that feels formative I mean you witnessed some things things that were very bad. Hmm. And as opposed to just letting them go on, you chose to stand up and basically ended your own policing career over that. I did. You've now written two different books Mm -hmm. sort of looking at this. I'm wondering if you have a sense if if things have gotten better, if a rookie cop today would see (laughs) the same things that you saw, which sounds like they pretty much started on your first day. I'm sorry. I wish listeners could see the look on my face when you asked me that question. (laughs) Yeah, that was a look. (laughs) Uh, No. Uh, So I'm, I'm going to recognize that I have not physically been a police officer in several years, but I have stayed very much in tune and in contact with uh, police officers on a literally a daily basis, in addition to, you know, conducting academic research and all those different kinds of things. Uh, So the first book was called Walking the Blue Line, a police officer turned community activist provides solutions to the racial divide. And that was, I told my story of what my experience was being a police officer from um, very early on, uh, my second training officer uh, falsified a police report in my name. And when I pushed back against that, I was literally threatened and told, you'll be out here by yourself if you ever do that again. Um, And then that police officer years later was uh, relieved of duty because it was found out that he was uh, profiling and free casing uh, citizens. And I tried to tell people about that. 
you know, in my first six months on the on the job and nobody paid attention to me. Uh, eventually I left because I ended up testifying against my partner uh, who I had in year number four of policing uh, because he falsified a police report. And I always, when I tell the story, I always make sure to say, like, like these were not innocent people in the big picture sense. Like one of the guys legitimately sold drugs. Another guy had previously gone to jail. The point was you don't have to lie to lock people up. Mm -hmm. If you are doing the job correctly, those things come out. But the nature of policing in St. Louis is not to do that, or it was not when I was a police officer. Uh, and it's hard for me to think that it's changed, especially with the conversations that I have with officers now. Hmm. Uh, so policing is not about helping people. It's about maintaining the system. And I want to make sure that people understand what I'm saying clearly. I am not attacking individual officers. That's not it. What I'm saying is the system, the way that it is, the way that our legal structure is set up, it is not first about helping people. It is about maintaining quotas, all those different kinds of things. Uh, when a police officer can go to my community in North St. Louis and arrest me for sitting out on the front porch, uh, but then go to a community in the Central West End and not get out of his car at all because he knows that he's going to get in trouble or she's going to get in trouble if he tries. they try to do the same thing in the Central West End. There, there's, we have to start answering questions, and it doesn't matter if the chief is black, white, male, or female. The system has been in place for so long that it's going to continue to do the thing that it does. And the second book that I wrote was called Police on a Pedestal, um, and it was a call to white Christians. So I'm a Christian, doesn't matter in the big scheme of things, but when Michael Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson, um, many of my white friends, Christian friends, uh, came to me and asked, why are black people so angry all the time? Why can't they just do what they are told to do? Why do they have to always fight the police? And my response was like, you don't even understand the history of police and the black community. So how are you asking these kinds of questions? You know, these are the wrong questions mm -hmm. to ask. The question should be, is why do they feel like they are being policed in a way that's different from what everybody else is being policed the way people are being policed. And so that book was an academic, actually a theological book to try to help, um, you know, white Christians understand um, the difference in how our communities legitimately are policed. And I'll give one example, and I know we can move on from there. Um, when I wrote that book in 2017, um, I used a study from Oakland um, that was conducted by researchers from Stanford. And these researchers only listened to the audio of police interactions with people. So you did, only thing you knew was it was a male or a female. Mm -hmm. And actually sometimes you didn't even know if they were male or female based on their voices. And people were asked to judge how those interactions went. And just, there was a drastic difference in how police officers interacted with white citizens and black citizens. And it did not matter what the crime was or any of those things. They always treated black people much more severely, even for a traffic stop versus uh, they treated white people more kindly, even when it was something really drastic. Well, they just updated that study uh, less than a year ago and they didn't even use the audio. They just used transcripts this time. <laughs> and the written transcripts, again, showed the exact same thing to the exact say, uh, level of severity. That's not unique to Oakland. Yeah. That is literally every day in St. Louis. And for people who go, well, that's not what I experienced. Well, count yourself lucky that that's not what you experienced, but don't discount the experiences of this other group of people who are saying this is what happens to them on a daily basis. Well, that um, that was a long but a very important answer, I I'm think, sorry. to my question. No, I just, <laughs> I want to say I asked, are things getting better? And that was a necessary dose right there. No, um, things are not getting and better. sadly, we are out of time. But <laughs> I, I appreciate just the, the sincerity in your answer there. And I wish you the best of luck in this work at Rise Community Development. Um, this is really important work you're yeah. doing there. So, Terrell Carter, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. And I look forward to hopefully being invited back again so I can give a much simpler answer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, we just have a lot more to talk about, so it's, it's good. Uh, Terrell, again, is the new executive director of RISE Community Development. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you 
find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.